Welcome to the Untold Tales Audio Anthologies. Written by Don Muchao and narrated by Melissa Del Toro Schaffner. Destiny's Doorstep The white man's dead forget the country of their birth when they go to walk among the stars. Chief Seattle As he clambered down the rocky path to the meeting with Ukwahm, Delvin Chance couldn't get a tune out of his head. That tune was Dvorak's Symphony No. 9, the New World Symphony. It was the stuff of old westerns, at the same time wild and sweeping, subtle and mysterious, and full of promise. At the bottom of the steep tree-shrouded path was a clearing, and in that clearing, on top of a feldspar outcropping and shrouded by a dark cover of vlei leaves, stood Wa, placid, wide-lipped, and expressionless, like a frog Buddha. Scarcely a thousand meters away, the scout ship Alyssa Minyard hovered over a thicket of iridescent wulana grass that blew back and forth in the wind, driven like seaweed at low tide. All the way down, he'd been beaten in the face by tiny branches that nicked and whipped his face like bamboo. It was punishing to travel even a short distance in this wilderness. It had taken him almost 90 minutes to hack his way through the fibrous mass just to keep his appointment. Not that the Elmen cared about time, but Delvin's bosses did. He wondered why Wa hadn't picked somewhere more public. God damn it, Delvin muttered as his foot shot out from under him and his backside met with a sharp edge of a rock. Tomorrow morning, that was going to hurt. You've been fighting the land for over an hour, Wa said in a gruff musical gurgle. Who is winning? Delvin picked himself up. The Elman was smiling. It had taken him a while to tell their facial expressions apart, as they had different bone structure and a different culture. And the absence of a threat telegraphed the broad, rubbery grimace as the reflection of an amused internal state. Beyond the forest, the wind was picking up. Most likely, they were in for storms. Delvin hoped they didn't interrupt communications with the Minyard, his only link to the outside world. Let's get on with this, he said. Patience, countered Wa. I know you seek treasure. That is transparent, and the Elmen wish no hostilities. We will show you. This way. With that, Wa hopped effortlessly off the rock, clambered down through the vines and onto a sun-mottled bark pathway that wandered aimlessly deeper into the woods. He waddled happily forward, as though guiding Delvin to the planet's most precious treasure were, well, a walk in the woods. With the brewing storm but without the benefit of the wind, the air was incredibly humid. Delvin wiped a trickle of sweat from his neck. This had better be good, he mouthed more to himself than anyone. Nevertheless, Wa picked it up. Oh, it is good, he chirped. The greatest treasure lies ahead. Back on Earth, the Elman Ambassador Mukmatul E strained to be heard above the din of the United Nations General Assembly. Please, shouted Secretary General Wells, let him speak! Model cleared his throat, a sound which was disconcerting to most humans, as it sounded like a really loud, crude belch. As stated before, he began, we have no use for the resources you wish to trade. We are happy where we are. But my people would like to reiterate that the object referred to you as GRS-1915-105 should remain off-limits. That, said Iranian President Suleiman Gorfrani, is not for you to decide. Your people are primitive. Have no use for it. You don't even understand it. Who is to stop us from taking it? The U.S. ambassador raised an eyebrow, but didn't say anything. 
A hubbub arose somewhere in the back of the chamber, but it died down swiftly. Model's face remained expressionless, but it seemed that he sighed. Do as you wish, he said. It is not mine to give. But civilizations greater than yours have tried to take GRS-1915 with disastrous results. And in short order, the most well-armed nations of Earth proclaimed, with cold conscience, their peaceful intent. Almost nine hours had passed since Delvin Chance disappeared into the forests. Wa showed no signs of tiring, and worse, Delvin still had that same little piece of Dvorak running through his head. His feet hurt, and he tried to make light conversation. So, how long have the Elmen been on Shangri-La? he asked. And why is it called that? Perhaps four thousand years, said Wa. Our history is spotty. Oral history tells of the dry times. We brought on much of the change ourselves, by not honoring the land. Some clung to the old ways. The rest of us tried to preserve what we had. As to why Shangri-La? Well, it is a peaceful existence one we struggled to achieve. We hold harmony in high regard. Delvin grunted as he stabbed his toe on an outcropping. We discovered our destiny was with the land, said Wa. Our people argue all the time, said Delvin. There's one war that's been going on for over a thousand years, and it looks like no end to it. Israelis and Palestinians. Wa stopped, stood up straight, and looked at Delvin over his thin, drooping shoulder. How sad, he said calmly, then turned his head back around and continued walking in his strange, goofy, loping way. The slope steepened again, and the cover changed from bark to brown, evergreen needles. Young, pine-like trees sprang up at the very edge of the path, and Delvin felt his footing slip on the needles. When resources are plentiful, Wa asked, why fight? When they are scarce, even greater is the need to share. Must a man always kill another to settle a disagreement? He scuttled ahead, leaving Delvin to climb gingerly down the slippery hillside. Wa waited at the bottom. The land leveled out, and a rock-covered path wended its way toward a field of tall grass to the east, which curved slowly toward the north. What is it like? he asked. War, I mean. We have not seen it in a long while. Dell's gaze tracked along the dirt path, and the land opened up into what might have easily been the virgin Great Plains known to the Oglala Sioux before the arrival of the white man. On a seemingly infinite sun-yellow field of grain, beneath the slate-blue thunderscape, as far as the eye could see, grazed thousands of lumbering beasts, each perhaps a half a ton in weight. Sweet mother of God, he exclaimed. That is beautiful. It started raining, and Wa hurried him along the path. Better hurry, he said. Treasure awaits. In the interstellar void, eight trillion kilometers from GRS-1915, the Freya Kirkland materialized. As he lit a bowl of Libris from an ornate console table in his quarters and inhaled the relaxing, thought-enhancing mist, Gardner Joy smiled through narrow teeth and the nearly lipless mouth the drug had given him. He put the bowl down and exhaled. This was too easy. Mick Motley had rolled over on his people, and it was at this very moment letting slip the dogs of war. He wondered if the Elmen had dogs or knew of the concept of hunting animals. If not, well, tough. They were about to find out. Perhaps four days' journey from here by zero drive lay Shangri-La. Beautiful place, really. It was too bad what was about to happen to it. It lay in an unfortunate position, though, of perhaps a hundred candidate planets, six of which were habitable. It was the nearest to the threshold of the wormhole, 
and the most obvious outpost for expansion into the neighborhood of the large Magellanic Cloud, at whose periphery sat the massive star factories of the now absent So Dan. For joy, control of Shangri-La meant control of the wormhole, the frontier, and bragging rights on what they found there. There had been a crimp in his plans. The Elmen, whose race lived on Shangri-La, claimed as an as-yet-unnamed treasure in the hinterlands of their world. He wondered absently why Model spoke nothing of it, and suspected something was being hidden. It sounded like a stalling tactic. In due time, he thought, it will all out itself. Z-drives are ready, sir. Captain Belker, a flame-haired Irishman, stood in the doorway. Joy motioned him into the room. Get us away from the horizon, he said. Then coast in. I don't want to scare the bejesus out of them until absolutely necessary. He looked around as though he were pretty certain Belker couldn't answer his next question. Where's Chance? Has anyone made contact with him yet? Not yet, sir. Big electrical storms on the surface at last report. Last transmission indicated the surface craft was transmitting okay, although the signal's off and on. His away unit is much weaker and probably more affected by the weather. How much longer before he gets back to the ship? His estimate was four days. That's cutting it tight. Shall I hold formation once we arrive? Joy reached for the bowl again and took another puff. For that pissant? No. Why do you think I gave him a deadline? So he'd be back on time. If he wants to go screw the natives, he'd better finish it in four days. Very well, sir. I'll instruct the fleet accordingly. Wa's pace quickened, and now it seemed relentless. Surely you must be wondering by now where we are going, he said. Delvin frowned as he tried to make out some spots moving on the horizon. The thought had crossed my mind. To meet my people, said Wa. They are long dead, you know, but it is tradition to remember the lives of our ancestors. Delvin's lips stretched into a parched, sun-baked smile. Finally, he muttered. It is there you will find what you are looking for, said Wa. And that is? What is treasure? Wa asked. What is knowledge? What is destiny? The simple man seeks treasure, the mature man knowledge, but the wise man seeks his destiny. Which do you seek, Delvin Chance? <laughs> You're a strange bird, Wa. As are you, my Delvin Chance. Your name and your language would appear to mean he who plunges head first into mystery. How apt. Our names used to mean something, said Delvin. <laughs> Not anymore. Wa acted as if Delvin hadn't spoken. My name, Ukwa Hm, means he stoops before greatness. But greatness has many faces. It is difficult to recognize, and it is not wise for a man to bow before false gods. They walked on for what seemed like forever. After a number of hours, the sun came out, despite the towering qual that never seemed to move from its position in the north. Delvin could tell now that the spots in the distance were dwellings. He wondered if he'd actually find any treasure where Wa was taking him, but he was willing to endure the side trip to see Wa's ancestors if it would just speed everything else up. Wa stopped, blinked, and looked back into the distance. The squall of storm clouds now cut a dark gray swath across a yellow sky. He leaned into the wind and quickened his pace. Perhaps he said something, but his voice was picked up and carried away. The structures surrounding the wormhole were unspeakably ancient. The most recent of them, a massive, half-finished cocoon-like Dyson sphere half a light year away, was, as well as anyone from Earth could tell from meteoric damage surveys, at least 20,000 years old, and the oldest of them perhaps a 100,000. It was hard to tell. 
The shells were in various states of completeness, and some undamaged. Regardless, there was little doubt that the Soyudan had risen to dominance and then faded into the mists of history, just as the first human tribes were mastering agriculture and flint axes. Gardener Joy wondered exactly what happened to the Soyudan and where they had gone. Certainly, anyone capable of taming the stars would have survived. But by now, they could be anywhere. He flipped off the display and looked through the space where it had been, toward the command cluster of the Freya Kirkland. A handful of research vessels had weeks ago been sent in the direction of the four closest star factories to make a survey of the Soyudan technology and to gather what they could about the civilization. But they were undefended, and Joy was concerned about Soyudan secrets being stolen out from under them. It was two days now to arrival in orbit around Shangri-La. Joy could taste the adrenaline. In less than a week, he would be the new governor, and he'd pick another name for the place, more befitting his inclination. He had ordered two V-class destroyers into position, each armed with a Baydrum liquefier, and two escort craft capable of taking and securing a fair number of hostages while defending themselves with the Star Splitter Grazers. They were old technology by now, but nevertheless would be effective against the ragtag assortment of Elmen, who had bothered to make their whereabouts known. What's the picture on the storms? Joy asked the science officer. Still building, the officer replied. It's a pretty wild place down there. Massive mountain ranges separated by deep valleys running east-west. The dominant weather system enters these valleys from the east and builds moisture around the southern edge of the main range in the north. The clouds sit there and build, increasing the albedo and causing electrical interference until a thick, cold layer develops underneath. <laughs> these storms are huge, General. Tornadoes the size of hurricanes. It's like Jupiter's great red spot. Deep violent, and persistent. Some of these cyclonic winds can form suddenly and go on for weeks without dissipating. Until they do, it's going to be touch and go getting chance off the surface, or getting any of our people down. Any news from chance? <laughs> Nothing. Joy frowned. Two days, he said. That's all he gets. Delvin could finally tell they were ascending to the other side of the wide valley. The land had changed from an open plain to rocky hillside dotted with bushes and trees that looked like mesquite and scrub oak. It reminded him of Arizona. Wa's manner grew more urgent. When about the hurry, though, all he would say was that it was important. On the way, they reached, then passed, hundreds of abandoned buildings, each massive and constructed out of stone, sod, and timber. They looked like they had been uninhabited for a long time. I gather this isn't where you live, Delvin said as the last of them faded into the distance behind them. No, said Wa, not in those buildings, not for a long time. Now come, let's hurry. He reached out a four-fingered hand toward Delvin and tried to pull him along. Delvin struggled. As if to underscore Wa's urgency, some distance behind them, a massive bolt of lightning struck one of the giant sod huts, obliterating it and setting the surrounding grass on fire. Then it began to rain. Yeoman Smith cleared his throat quietly at the threshold of General Joy's quarters. Captain Belker said to wake you, sir, he said. Joy opened the door to his cabin. Smith stood nonplussed for a moment, observing that the general was naked from the waist up and wearing a pair of powder blue pants with pictures of pink bunny rabbits. What's the matter? barked Joy. You never seen a man wearing pajamas? Smith cleared his throat. <clears throat> uh, sir, the Iranians just arrived this side of the wormhole. Four research vessels, lightly armed. The Hafiz, the Imam Ali, the Ibn Battuta, and the Al-Rashid. They appear similar to our warcraft in the area, but could be reconnaissance. Joy ducked back into his quarters and emerged half-dressed. How long ago? Just now. 
Captain Belcher said to tell you as soon as possible. Has he done anything yet? No, sir. I believe he is deciding whether to peel off our rear guard and face them down, or to proceed to Shangri-La and commence operations. He requests your counsel on that matter. Belker says he thinks they'll head for the closest of the star factories. Of the four, Anubis, Bast, Knum, and Sobek. Anubis is the closest. Uwe Windgren maneuvered the Beta Pavonis into the space just outside the Anubis factory. Scans for hundreds of AUs around the structure indicated that it was not only the most massive object in this region of space, but it was also the only object apart from the Beta Pavonis, and it was the size of the Earth's solar system. According to the ship's records, the area occupied by Anubis had once been the home to a low-mass X-ray binary black hole. And the Soyudan had managed not just to tame this thing, thought Uve. They had manufactured an enclosure for it. She wondered what they would find when they landed on the outside of this fantastic, exotic structure. Even to her, as leader of an experienced cultural recovery team, it was completely unfathomable. The concussion wave from the lightning was overwhelming. Wa stumbled and fell, and Delvin tumbled over him, landing on his back. Around them, the grass smoked and burned. <laughs> that was close, he shouted. That was nothing, said Wa. The weather will get much more violent if we stay here. Delvin paused. Wa, there's something I need to tell you, he began. It's been on my mind for a while. Just then, another violent thunderclap shook the air, and he could feel it prickling the hairs on his neck. In a surprising show of strength, Wa reached out, grabbed Delvin, and put him on his back. You can tell me when we reach the cave. Wa broke into a run. Delvin had never seen him go that fast. He half-bounded, picking his way among the increasingly frequent rocks that cluttered the upslope. Wa had said he'd been here before, to honor his ancestors. Maybe he knew the place, but Delvin didn't. There was no way he'd make it back to the Alyssa Minyard in less than two days. After making one loop around the periphery of Bast, Captain Rick Peterson decided to land the Betty Jane Ferguson directly on the gargantuan toroidal structure. And unlike the crew of the Beta Pavonis, as soon as he did, everyone could feel a rhythmic vibration every few seconds through the hull of the ship. That would be black holes passing underneath, he said. Holy shit, it's still operational. Senior research scientist Andy Yee vocalized what most were thinking. Whoever built this would have to have cleared most of the inner planets to make the shell, then cover two co-orbiting black holes in some kind of structure that doesn't collapse, then stabilized the whole environment so that the X-ray beam pointed consistently in one direction. Why? Commander Stephanie Behrens looked up from her hollow screen. I've got news for you guys. Beta Pavonis just completed her scan of Anubis. So it's not so you technology we're looking at. Less than 24 hours remained, and General Joy was pacing nervously on the bridge of the Freya Kirkland. The U.S.-led alliance had managed to summon 12 additional battlecraft into Shangri-La space, with a rear guard of four light strikers closely watching the Iranians, making for a total of 16. Since the Iranians arrived and started making their way slowly toward Anubis, a diplomatic vessel from Turkey, the Kamal Atta Turk, had appeared between the U.S. and the Iranians. Joy wasn't pleased. They get so much as a parsec from any one of the star factories, I want them struck out of the sky and pushed into the X-ray beam so it looks like an accident. Aye, aye, sir, said Belker. He looked up at Joy. A few questions, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Suppose Chance doesn't return within 24 hours. I want those little Elman shits cowering under rocks, said Joy. Maximum force! I don't care if he's still down there. Delvin and Wa sheltered under an overhang about a thousand meters up the mountainside. The weather was not as severe here, mostly gusting winds and constant cold rain. Delvin tried to slake his thirst under a rivulet of water that poured down from the edge. What was it you wanted to tell me back there? Wa asked. 
Delvin looked out into the distance. The storm seemed to be moving south. It looked pretty powerful. <sighs> I'm not going to make it back by tomorrow, he said. That is right, said Wa. When we met, you said you wanted to be shown my people's treasure. Our journey is almost complete. Back there, said Delvin, you said that a simple man seeks treasure, a smart man seeks knowledge, and a wise man seeks his destiny. Wa nodded. My superiors gave me four days, said Delvin, to negotiate with you for your people's treasure. After that, they planned to take it by force. He sighed heavily. That's what I wanted to tell you. I have betrayed you. You have not, said Wa. You followed me here. You told the truth. And now you will see your destiny. And what is that? Wa said, Your people plan to use Shangri-La as a staging ground for taking the Gloy. Gloy? There are shells built around very dense stars. The star factories! Delvin exclaimed. Yes! Then he paused. Wait, so you knew about this all along? Of course. We knew you would come. Our people's skills include statistical forecasting of bellwether events across the sparse networks. In its day, it was called prophecy, but the names don't matter. We knew. We used our science. And we knew. And yet you made no effort to stop us. Wa's eyes narrowed, and he looked straight at Delvin. There will be an attack on this planet in a few hours, yes? said Wa. Your people will occupy it. <laughs> you don't seem too concerned. It is inevitable, said Wa. He started up the mountainside again, then paused, looked up at the sky just as a scout drone from one of Joy's escort ships whizzed by in the distance. But survival is not. Your people will not attack while they seek you. But we are losing time, and there is still something I want you to see before it is destroyed. Any news from the scout drones? asked Belker. Negative, said the communications officer. Minor indications of living beings over a hundred kilos, no sign of civilization, and no signal from chance. Thought we might have gotten a blip. If there was a signal, it was weak, jammed, or otherwise undetectable. Any possibility that his power supply is dead? asked Belker, or blocked by terrain. Anything's possible, said Combs, but not knowable. Fire up the Badrons, said Joy. Stop diddling around. Chance will have to fend for himself if he's still down there. If he's smart, he'll get the hell out of Dodge before we rain hell to him. Very well, sir, said Belker. Weapons, stand by for my command. At the top of the ridge, the land leveled out, and Devon and Wa came to a huge hole in the mountainside that might have been a cave, had the perfectly circular opening not betrayed artifice. Delvin took in the scene. The interior of the cave wall was polished so smoothly that it was difficult to tell if it was stone or glass, and it was full of equipment. Lots of equipment. From the looks of it, advanced equipment, like antigrav pods and plasma weapons. I don't get it, said Delvin. Is this where your people live? Lived, said Wa. This is where we stayed when we first arrived, four thousand years ago. This place is now a museum. Wa motioned for Delvin to follow him inside. They made their way past intricate security doors through a maze of lights and floating displays whose purpose Delvin could only guess. Delvin was silent for several minutes, then finally said, I thought you told me the Elmen had only been here 4,000 years. You mean to say that after 300 years, your race rose from stone axes to this? No, my dear friend, not at all, said Wa. My people built this place after they arrived. They had ruined and hollowed out their own worlds, giving them up to grand projects, only to lose sight of their place in the cosmos. 
They thought they were masters, but they were slaves to their desires. That was two hundred years ago, long before we dispersed. Some of us landed here. We turned our backs on technology, seeing that it would not deliver them from evil. But seeing now your plans for us, perhaps we were wrong. Nevertheless, I am grateful for what we achieved in those days, for the worlds we built, and for the chance to discover how to live harmoniously. It is sad, however, that the old ways persist. They must be eliminated. Your people built the star factories, said Delvin. It wasn't the Soyudan at all? You have achieved knowledge, said Wa, and now we are at Destiny's doorstep. The research crews stationed at the star factories all communicated back to the Freya Kirkland, more or less simultaneously. Each of them had discovered more evidence of a consistent writing system, admittedly not much, but they were making progress on a suppositional grammar for the language. Its structure wasn't so Yudan at all. It was Elmeni. Meanwhile, all four research craft reported an increase in the frequency of rotation of the black holes inside the enclosures, as measured through the ship's hulls. Uwe Windgren sent an urgent missive to Captain Belker, asking whether he had advised withdrawal and under what conditions. Belker told them to hold position and report back if anything else changed. The Ibn Battuta and the al-Rashid peeled off from the close cluster of Iranian ships and the Kamal Ada Turk began to slacken pursuit. A couple strikers peeled off from the assault on Shangri-La to pursue them. Their pace slowed somewhat also, and Belker wondered if Gorfrani was giving them a good look at what they couldn't do anything about. Maybe it was bait. Maybe it was nothing. Not his problem. A soft chime went off on the bridge of the Freya Kirkland. Time's up, said General Joy. Time to cry havoc and all that. Commence firing, said Belker. Wa and Delvin emerged from the cave entrance just in time to see the colorless sweep of the Beidrun liquefier strike the mountains across the valley. Somewhere up there stood the Alyssa Minyard, now likely a heap of smoking ash. Molecular disruptors, said Wa. Very impressive. Your people have come quite a ways in just ten thousand years. Eight, said Delvin flatly. And I can't say it's progress. An area several hundred feet in amplitude simply disappeared from the underside of the mountain. The cap of it collapsed into the empty space below in a deafening roar so thunderous, even at this distance, that it made Krakatoa and several recent nuclear explosions pale by comparison. It wouldn't take long for the ash cloud to reach them, even at altitude. And Joy hadn't even fired the grazers yet. A second nearly invisible beam plowed silently through the middle of the valley, digging deep into the ground and releasing towering geysers of crustal rock and mantle from a fissure that must have been several kilometers wide. Impressive indeed, said Wa. It is a shame that we will not survive to tell of it. But our people will. Elsewhere from here, they will learn the long lessons of history. A wise man seeks his destiny, said Delvin. You knew all along that they would destroy this world. Christ, you didn't even fight back. He looked up at the sky and sighed. Wah, I'm a damned fool. With his thin fingers, Wah reached out a hand and placed it on Delvin's shoulder. I pity your people, he said, but you and I will meet the great consciousness as friends. And for the first time since humans stood erect, the ancient star cannons of the Elmen powered up and aimed in unison at Earth. It's a new season, and we have some new authors and new storylines that will absolutely delight you. And as you know, we absolutely love our listeners, fans, and patrons. If you loved what you heard, consider joining us over on Patreon. That's where all the fun happens. 
just visit www.patreon.com forward slash Melissa Del Toro voiceover. If you'd like to read more of the stories in the Untold Tales series, not narrated here on our podcast, you can find Jeff's books on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle format. The links for all of this information are conveniently listed in this episode's show notes. Thank you and have a wonderful day.